Hey man, thanks Anna Marie. I um, did not know that Richard was going to do a, a thing on tithing. Where uh, our our passage of scripture takes us into that a little bit today. Interestingly enough. But first, I would like to welcome my very special friend Doug Fortune. Can I? Can, can you just stand up and turn around? This guy is a friend of mine, one of my oldest friends in the whole world. We've known each other since grade eight, and we we uh, endured Whitehorse together in our early days, and um, uh, then we both um, came into a wonderful experience of God and and uh, became leaders and became pastors in the same place for a little while. And then he has been pastoring all these years, and he's currently pastoring People's Church on 104th in Surrey. And so, if you ever get to, Sur if you're ever on holidays in Surrey, you know, and you decide to go to church on Sunday, People's Church in Surrey on 104th, it's a great place. I'm so privileged to have Doug here today as my friend. He came to help us, just to congratulate us on our 40th, and. Uh, just to be, he's, he was in my wedding, he was a groomsman, and you know, so he, it's so amazing to have old friends from when you were kids. The only trouble is, they can tell stories about you. This thing is super duper loud, and it'd be good if you didn't, it's like it's, I'm blowing my own ears out. The only thing about it is, is that he knows me for so long that he can tell all these bad stories, so I'm never going to give him the mic, because... Uh, he could tell stories about our, our wicked high school days and, uh, and so on. But the thing I have over him is that I could tell stories on him too. So a uh, church full of people and Surrey would probably be interested in that too. But welcome here, Doug. It's a real blessing and honor to have you here. Thank you. So we're in Hebrews chapter 7. And we love going through the Word, don't we? Because the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is is sharp and quick and, and powerful, and the Word of God will change our life. And so we're not so much interested in, you know, uh, a lot of opinions about uh, different things. We're interested in finding out what the Word of God says about our lives and how we can apply the Word of God to our lives, because that's how real change happens. You can follow somebody's strategy or somebody's philosophy or somebody else's, you know, get rich or get this or get that or get thin program or whatever it is. But you know, when you want to find out then stick to the simple gospel, as we talked about today, laying aside religion, you know, and the things that so easily come and, and associate themselves with the truth of the gospel and add it on. It's so important that we know that the, what the word of God says is what the truth is. And we need to base our lives on that. The book of Hebrews, as I've said before, is a book written to people who are steeped in religion, who are steeped in religion with the actual one true God of the universe, not pagan religions worshiping idols, but they were steeped in an old covenant religion, and the book of Hebrews is the one that, that takes these people through this process of coming out of old covenant thinking and entering into the new covenant. And so, uh, you know, we've talked about... Um, that the book of Hebrews is, the, is where we get a book out of which we get a clear explanation of a lot of our theology. And I want you to know that uh, we also get the Father Heart message very, very clearly in the book of Hebrews. And you'll see it again today, as I trust you've seen it through the first six chapters. But the, the emphasis uh, today in chapter 7 is on the high priesthood of Jesus. And so, why is that important? Every culture has a religion. Every culture around the world has religion. And every religion has people who are leaders of it, or, you know, shamans, or priests, or, you know, whatever. But people who, uh, you know, it is their role in their religion to kind of stand between whatever is the deity and the people, and sort of um, often, you know, um, you know, speak for or be the intermediary. It's, it's just a part of most religions. And so even in the Old Covenant, of course, there were priests who offered sacrifices. And so they, they, would, they would take sacrifices from the people, as we've already learned in Hebrews and will continue to learn as we go through this. You know, they would take the sacrifices in the Old Covenant, and they would pre the priest would present and, and offer the sacrifice, you know, in the prescribed way that God had told them to. And then the people were in right standing with God, temporarily, as we will see. But so, the, so 
It's interesting that um, all the way through, like from chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and now in 7, the writer to the Hebrews talks about Jesus being the high priest. So Jesus is the high priest. And, and we're going to emphasize today the eternal high priest. He's a high, the high priest forever because he, is, he lives forever. And so we're, we're just going to uh, look at the last two verses of, of Hebrews 6, first of all, as we do sometimes just to catch up with where we were last week. So the, if you have that one up there, 6, 19, and 20 says this, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. What is he talking about? He's talking about God gave his word that he would pour blessing on his people. And then he also, he also made an oath. He swore by himself that he would keep his word. So by two unchangeable things, he gave his word and he swore an oath that he would bless us and bless his people. And so this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. I want you to know that that is the purpose of creation, to take you and to take you from your place in the dust, as we sang, and to pick you up and to, and to, and to apply the blood of Jesus to your life, this, the one-time sacrifice for all, so that Jesus can take you and introduce you to the Father. The Father wants you to enter the inner sanctuary. In the Old Covenant testimony, the inner sanctuary was absolutely and strictly forbidden for anyone to enter except the high priest, which was there was only one at a time. The high priest among all the priests could enter once a year on a certain day, and, and he, could, he had to do everything perfectly right, or he might be struck dead, and you know, be, had to be... Had to, rope tied around his ankle in case he did something wrong and was struck dead so they could drag him out because if anyone else went in they'd be they'd be dead too so you know it was this inner sanctuary was this woo you don't ever want to go there because it's the you know it's like you know it's, it is the presence of God but you see Jesus as our high priest has done the sacrifice paid the price and now he wants to take us into that inner sanctuary so what I mean by we get our theology from a lot of our theology from the book of Hebrews. And a clear understanding of God's purpose. His purpose is not to keep us on the outside. He's not to keep us out in the outer courts, on the fringes of life. He wants to bring us. Jesus will bring us. He's already gone in there for us. And he has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now chapter 7 goes on to talk about this Melchizedek character. Who only shows up in a couple of other verses in the whole Bible. The author to the Hebrews talks more about him than anybody else. He's only in a couple verses in Genesis 14, one incident with Abraham. We're going to talk about that. So I'm going to read a lot of these verses, maybe eight or ten of them, and then we're going to make some comments about it. So, verse 1, 7 verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning uh, home from winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Verse 2, I'll just keep going through these if you want to keep putting them up. When Abraham, then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of God. As I said to you before, when he first came up in our study of Hebrews, he's kind of this mystery personage. You know, he's kind of this person that, you know, nobody, there's nothing else that we know about him. He's mentioned in, in this one incident of Abraham returning from a great war that he had, that he one and Melchizedek meets him and then again in Psalm 110 David prophesies about Jesus that Jesus will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek and now Hebrews brings it up again so he remains a priest forever resembling the son of God verse 4 consider then how great this Melchizedek was even Abraham the great patriarch of Israel recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle Interesting to know that he's pointing out that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, which is saying something because in old, you know, in Hebrew culture, Abraham was the man. There was Abraham and Moses, right? And, and they were like the, the patriarchs, of, you know, that they looked to. And uh, the writer here is considering that, you know, telling us to consider that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Verse 5, now the law of Moses required that the priests who were descendants of Levi 
must collect a tithe from the rest of the people who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who is not a descendant of Levi, now it gets a little technical, I'm just, that's why I'm reading this through. He collected a tenth from Abraham, and Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. Again, the mystery. Verse 9, in addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collected the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid the tithe to him. For though Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. I, I want you to, to understand that he's written here about eight or nine or ten verses about the tithe. And so I am going to take the opportunity to comment on the tithe, if that's okay. And uh, because it, it, is, it is mentioned here in this book, like I said, I didn't know Richard was also going to bring it up. But what I want to say to you about the tithe is, uh, is that it does predate the giving of the law. Okay? Abraham gave a tenth of what he had won in this battle against multiple kings, an alliance of multiple kings. The original battle he was not involved in, but somebody told him that your nephew Lot and all of his family and all of his possessions have been taken captive in this great battle between nine other kings, five against four, the Genesis says. And then Abraham heard about it, and so he armed his own men, and he went out after the people who had captured his nephew and defeated them all and won everything back and all kinds of spoil and so on, all kinds of goods that they liberated from the bad guys, you know? So then he meets Melchizedek, and Melchizedek, it says in Genesis 14, brings bread and wine, interesting, uh, parallel, and then he, he places a blessing on Abraham, and he says, blessed be Abraham of the God most, of God most high. Now, it, it also says that Melchizedek was a priest of God most high. And so Abraham, without, without being told to, or without there being any law about tithe, decides to give Melchizedek a tenth of everything that he had. Okay? And so, let's comment a bit on this. Abraham demonstrated the principle of honor. Now, the seeds of the tithe principle are this. Giving a significant, measurable amount of your income to honor someone greater than yourself as a response to his blessing on your life. And this, again, predates the giving of the law. It was made a law. God made it into the law of Moses hundreds of years later because people are tend to be withholding, don't we? All of us. We tend to think of what we have as ours. And so, in order for us not to fall into the trap of thinking that, you know, Jehovah Jireh, uh, my provider, yeah, good for, that's good, good for him, but I'm going to look after myself. I'm going to provide for myself, so I'm going to hang on to everything I make, because everything I make, I made. And they don't understand the principle that God is the one who gives the power to get wealth. You couldn't draw your next breath without God. So just forget about your own self-sufficiency and how great you are at providing. Right? You, you couldn't do a thing. You couldn't hold down a job. You couldn't do anything without God. Like I said, you couldn't even take your next breath. And so it is the principle of honor that God is, is and uh, was establishing and is establishing. He made it into a law so that whenever they made a profit, they would have to remember and say, ah, yes, a tenth of this belongs to God. And the law was laid down like, boy, you just better, you know, you just better do this because the blessing of God would be tangibly removed from your life if you didn't. It's like all the other laws that, that were laid down. If you sinned in some way and didn't take the prescribed law, you know, this, what the law prescribed, like a, you know, a bag of flour and a turtle dove for some sin, you know, or whatever, and take it to the priest and have him do his thing and then you're forgiven. If you decided not to do that, you were not forgiven. You were not in right standing with God. If you decided not to tithe, you were not in right standing with God in the Old Testament law. Why did he make it a law? Because we're by nature withholding. 
You see, the law is always to bring, was always even to bring blessing. The way God works, the principles of God are always to bring blessing. He wants us to understand the principle of honor. He wants us to understand that every breath we take comes from him. He wants us to understand that the job that we have came from him, that the provision comes from him, that he gives the ability to earn money and the ability, you know, and, and can withhold it. And he wants you to live in blessing. He's not looking for an excuse to smack you. He's not looking to, to you know, disqualify you somehow on some technicality. It's not like that. But he made it into a law because people quickly forget and think that they're the ones who provide for themselves. I've seen this happen so often to people in my lifetime where they have said, you know, that's it, I don't believe in it, forget about it, I'm not, and, and I'm not even talking specifically about a tithe, which of course means a tenth. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, you get offerings for $106.47 because that's exactly a tenth, you know, or whatever. But, you know, we're not even talking about being nitpicky and stuff like that. If you do that, good for you, keep it up. You know, do what, do what God inspires you to do. That's the point of the new covenant. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart, right? Just keep on obeying what God tells you to do. But the tithe is to be, whether it's 10% or 15 or 20 or whatever you want to give, you know, you, you, there's so many stories about not, you can't outgive God. There's stories of people in business who, you know, Reuben was an example, who just gave and gave and gave and gave, and his business thrived and prospered anyways, you know, because of, because of that, because he could live in a place of, of you know, and, and so many others, examples that I know. But there's so many people who decided not to, decided, you know, that's Old Testament, I'm not doing that, that's part of the law, we're not under the law, we're under grace, and so therefore everything is mine, you know. And the principle of honor has been negated. The principle of honor, God's principle, has been destroyed. And the principle is, is that you take a, a measurable and significant, not peanuts and pennies, a significant, not enough to kill you and make you go broke. God's not trying to get you sort of thrown out of your apartment. What God is trying to do is get you to recognize the principle of honor. God pours blessing on your life, like Melchizedek did to Abraham, and, and as a complete response outside of the law, Abraham decides to give a gift to Melchizedek. This is the principle of honor. The person receiving the blessing gives back to the person who is giving the blessing, which is God. You get it? So the issue of tithing today is not if you give 10% you're in right standing with God, and if you don't give 10% you're not in right standing with God. That's old covenant thinking. New covenant thinking is today if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. You need to ask God about that. You need to ask God about everything you do as he brings it to your attention about every habit that you have, about every decision you make, about where to live, what job to do, about who to befriend, about who, you know, who to, what should I do today, should be bounced off of God. And tithing is just one of those things. Somebody mentioned today already that, you know, it was preached that God owns all of us. Well, you know what the truth is? God does own all of us, and he loves us. The New Covenant thinking is not 10%. It's not the Sabbath is a holy day, and every other day is your day to do whatever you please. Every day belongs to God. Every part of my time, energy, and money belongs to God. Every bit of it. But he's such a great father that he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, ask us always to just, you know, give everything you have, give it away, you know, get thrown out on the street, you know, it's okay, you know. He's not like that. He wants to bless your life. But he wants you to remember where the blessing comes from. And the principle of honor helps you to remember consistently and faithfully where your blessing comes from. Okay. I think we beat that one up pretty good, didn't we? All right. The principle of honor. Abraham demonstrated it long before the law was given that turned tithing into a law. So, going into verse 11. So a new priesthood is needed. 
Verse 11 says, If the priesthood of Levi, on, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? As I said to you at the beginning, the writer, uh, the author to the Hebrew people here in this book is busy deconstructing their religion. Okay? Excuse me a sec. Did you hear what I said? He's deconstructing their religion. But you know why? Because the old covenant is obsolete. We'll hear about that in a minute. It's useless. It's ineffective. It never could accomplish bringing people into, right, real, into permanent right relationship with God. It was always very temporary and very conditional. It was put in place until the perfect time that God decided to bring Jesus and, and, do the and make the final sacrifice and pay the price for right standing with God. The goal was always right standing with God. But God, in the fullness of time, somehow, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder about God's timing. You know, it's a little different from my timing. When I hear about blessings that are coming in my life, I say, okay, well, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning, and those blessings will be on my life. And sometimes God says, yeah, soon. <laughs> what is soon, you know? I hate that day as a thousand years, and so, you know. <laughs> like, in my lifetime, certainly, I hope. But in the fullness of time, when God decided over thousands of years that, bang, this is the moment to bring Jesus into play, to, to send his son to pay the price so we could have permanent and, and perfect relationship with the Father. That was the right time. And so he came to, to pay the price. And it makes the old obsolete, as we'll see. So he's deconstructing their religion. A new covenant is now in place. And... The Hebrews is also very strong on, in the first couple chapters, particularly on that there be no mixture of the two. And so, you know, that's what happens to us. And I read you that quote from Eugene Peterson at the beginning of his translation of the book of Hebrews is how we dilute the purity of the simple gospel and we complicate the simplicity of the simple gospel with adding rules that we've made up. You know, rules for who's in and who's out so we can tell who's pure and who isn't. You know, who's righteous and who isn't. When these things need, uh, have been decided already by the sacrifice of Jesus. If you're a child of God, if you've given your life to God, if you've, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, whatever you want to, however you want to term that, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are now considered holy and blameless. You are in Christ. You are seated with him in heavenly places. And when you sin, you, uh, you have, when you do something that is against that, that it will grieve your heart because he promises that my, my laws will I write on their heart. I won't write them on stone tables. I won't, you know, put them in a, in a code, you know, six inches thick so we can look up, oh, that's in. How do, what do we do? About, you know, what's the correct? You know, he says, I'll write it on your hearts. And as you grow in your Christian experience, as you grow in your relationship with God, God, and you do something that, you know, you've done a thousand times before in your life, and suddenly you realize that this action or this attitude actually grieves God, and you will, are, you will grow so in love with God that you will want to throw everything out of your life in a quick hurry that actually displeases God. But in the process, God loves you like a son or daughter. He completely accepts you. He knows that because of what Jesus did, you are a son or daughter of the king of the universe. Wow. And so... This is relevant for us today. Like the, the Hebrew Christians were constantly in a battle because, like I said, their old religion was with the God of the, who created every, he, you know, the God of the universe. It's confusing. It'd be easier to be a pagan Gentile because, you know, you could see the difference between the demonic gods and the God of the universe. Well, I used to serve that completely other than God. You know, now I'm serving the true God of the universe. Well, the Hebrew people were confused and their leaders were threatened and made insecure by this new covenant because they had a system. In Jesus' day, the priests pretty much ruled society. 
didn't they? People were in fear. In John chapter 9, the blind guy, you know, blind from birth that Jesus heals, and they go to his parents, and the, and the parents say, well, don't talk to us. Go talk to him. Why? Because they were afraid of getting thrown out of society, thrown out of the synagogue. The priests ruled the day, and so they were jealous, and when, you know, when the old is, is becoming obsolete, they're fighting against it. And it went on and on and on in the New Testament church. There was councils about it and, and so on, about what should we do about Gentile Christians? How should we, you know, what parts of Moses' law should we have them, you know, fulfill? And, of course, the answer is none. None. It's Jesus and Jesus only. And so it's a new covenant. This is relevant for us as well. Because sometimes we find, often we find that the religious system that we grew up in or have been involved with has a mixture of the simple gospel and some fear and guilt ridden rules which we must follow in order to seem, in order to be right with God. It's just traditional, right? It's a system of religion. Now I'm not against systems. Anytime you get a group of people together trying to form a community, there must be some structure in order to facilitate the community. In Acts, you know, the apostles were running around handing out, you know, distributing to the poor, and it became too much. They couldn't even pray or, or preach the gospel anymore. So they, what did they do? They created a system, didn't they? They created a bit of structure. They said, let's appoint seven guys, and they can look after this for us so we can carry on with what we're called to do as, as apostles, right? And so we're not against systems, we're, but we're against using systems to tell who's in or who's out. And right, whether, you know, judging somebody, whether they're in right standing with God, if they obey our tradition or our rule. Wow. So religious leaders in the New Testament placed precious few regulations on new converts to Christianity. Instead, they stuck to the simple gospel of this incredible, unprecedented relationship that every person could have with God. It's too good to be true, I'm telling you. And the Hebrew people were, were caught up in this, in this scene of the inner court, of the holy of holies, and, you know, death to you if you went in, if you weren't the high priest, and only once a year, and I know all this, like, so afraid of the presence of God, of the actual presence of God. They wanted God's blessing, but they couldn't really have relationship with him. But now, as we read in 6, 19, and 20, God, Jesus, wants to take us into the inner sanctuary, right into the holy of holies, right into the presence of God. Huh. Incredible, unprecedented in history, what Jesus has accomplished for us. So the New Testament leaders made up some systems, but they kept it pretty minimal. Verse 12, we're moving. If the priesthood had changed, then the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we're talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Oh dear, he's breaking the rules, you know. How dare they proclaim Jesus a priest? Everybody knows you can't be a priest unless you're from the tribe of Levi. Breaking the rules again. Verse 15, this change was made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You see, in the old system, you became a priest because your dad was a priest, because you could trace your lineage back to Levi, one of the sons of Jacob, right? And so one of the 12 sons, you know, headed up the 12 tribes of Israel and so on. And so if you were a Levite, you made your living off the tithe. You made your, that was your income and you were a priest or a temple worker or whatever, or a deacon or something. You know, but there couldn't be that many priests, but, you know, sort of thing. But you were part of that crew, and that was the requirement. Somebody from Judah couldn't say, hey, I want to I be baptized. Uh, I want to become a baptized Levite because I'm sick of farming, and I, you know, I, I want to be a priest now. No, you couldn't. You couldn't do that. It wasn't allowed. And so Jesus broke the rule. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, if you traced his family back. And so the writer just points that out. And so... 
what was the requirement, and we've already been through this in the earlier chapters, what was the requirement that God placed on Jesus in order to become the priest? What? God put requirements on Jesus? Yes, he did. It says he was tempted and tested in all ways that we are, yet without sin. It says he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. We've, we've been through all this. It says, and because he came through with flying colors, God has authorized him to become the priest. Was there ever any doubt? Of course not, because they know the end from the beginning. But the point was, Jesus, having laid aside his divinity and all his power to have sparks coming out of his fingernails, you know, he just laid it all aside, became a human being. He, as we had said the last couple times, he was not born with the sin nature of Adam, but he was born with the ability to choose, as Adam was before the fall, to obey God or disobey God, and he chose right every time. And therefore, God has proclaimed him with an oath that you, as we'll read, that you are the high priest forever. Let's carry on. Verse 18. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. This guy is not gaining friends with the old Jewish culture, is he? He's not really winning over any of the old hardliners. Calling it weak and useless. Honestly. For the law never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. The message puts it this way, another way, Jesus, a way that does work, that brings us right into the presence of God, is put in his place. I want you to see again, sometimes you read phrases over and you don't see the importance of them. But you see, because of what Jesus did, we can draw near to God. You see, drawing near to God is the goal. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, how many, say nobody. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. What is the goal? Getting to the Father. And so Jesus is our high priest. He's our champion. He's our hero. He's the one who paid the price so that we could have access to God. Drawing near to God. Drawing near to Father is the goal. Verse 20. So this new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there was an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Verse 22. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees a better covenant with God. The message says he makes Jesus the guarantee of a far better way between us and God, one that really works, a new covenant. You see, remember, we've been talking about it. The old covenant didn't really work because you know what? You could take your pinch of flour and your turtle dove, go and get completely, you know, set up and now I'm in right standing with God. And before you got 10 paces out of there, you might have done some other thing wrong and now you'd have to go and collect some, some more material goods and bring them to the priest and it could never make anybody perfect. Do you understand why it was put in place temporarily as a schoolmaster, Paul teaches, you know, as a tutor, to get us ready for Jesus, to get us so sick and tired of the fact that we couldn't do it on our own, that when Jesus came to bring us into permanent right standing with God, it's like the gospel is too good to be true. It's just so good. And so, it's a covenant that really works. Verse 23, there are many priests under the old system for death prevented them from remaining in office, but because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, verse 25, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Once again, what's the goal? Drawing near to God through Jesus. Is Jesus important? Is Jesus central to this whole thing? This whole book is about Jesus and Jesus introducing a new covenant. And Jesus, who said of himself in our study on John all those months ago, Mike, yeah, that, still a private joke, but <laughs> in our study on John, in John, 
Jesus said very clearly, I never do anything unless I see my Father doing it. I never say anything unless I hear my Father saying it. My, I don't have a mission of my own. My mission is to do the will of him who sent me. My mission is the Father's mission. I'm here to show you who the Father is, to demonstrate for you how the Father thinks and feels and acts by everything I do because I only watch my Father and then do copy what I see him doing. All of his acts, he says, I do nothing. Somebody say nothing. I do nothing of my own initiative. I'm not making this stuff up. This is in the Bible. So is Jesus central? Of course he is. And his mission is to bring us to the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for being faithful to that. So the goal is God himself. We get to draw near to God our Father through Jesus. Verse 26. So now we have a high priest who perfectly fits our needs, completely holy, <coughs> uncompromised by sin, with authority extending as high as God's presence in heaven itself. He's not some underling, you know. He's not some, you know, he's seated on the throne right beside God. Seated at the right hand of God. King of the universe. With authority that extends right into the presence of God. Jesus is the champion. Yeah. Unlike other high priests, he does not, verse 27, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Verse 28, final verse. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. The message says, who were never able to get the job done right. Once again, just not winning friends with the old Hebrew culture, was he? Never get the job done right. Oh dear. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. You see, that's our, prom that's our hope. That's what is our firm and unshakable anchor, no matter what happens to us in our lifetime, no matter what happens to us day by day, no matter the situations and circumstances that we face, our, our sure and certain hope that we are encouraged to hang on to is that God has said, I will bless you. I will accept you. I will receive you into my family because of what Jesus did. If you believe in Jesus, John 1, 12, I will give you the power and the authority to become a child of God. No more fear and trembling. I don't even want to get close to the Holy of Holies for fear, you know, a spark might fly out and nuke me or something, you know. Like, it's, it's no more fear of God's presence. That's why it was so symbolic when Jesus died, when the temple in the curtain, one of the Gospels records, the huge, thick temple uh, that protected the people from God's presence, that kept the people out so they couldn't even see in, you know? It was just like, holy. That curtain was ripped in half from the top to the bottom. And I always think it's, it says specifically from the top to the bottom because God obviously ripped the curtain in half right from the top down to the bottom. Not halfway. He didn't poke a little peaky hole in there for us to, to look through. He ripped it wide open. Why? Because now the way is open to our relationship with our Father. Wow. That's just so good. So the one who made the way for us, chapter 7 says, is our faithful high priest, Jesus. He's waiting to take us, chapter 6, 19 says, through the curtain into the inner sanctuary, right into the very presence of God, 7 verse 19, with a new covenant between us and God, one that really works. Isn't that awesome? So because he's our faithful high priest with authority extending as high as the presence of God in heaven himself, he is able and willing to introduce us to the Father and build, help us establish a personal relationship with God, our Father himself. This is why, if you remember, chapter 5 ended with this. You guys have been Christians for so long, you ought to be teaching other people about the you know, deeper things of God, but you have decided that to revert to being babies and you still need milk. Now, there's nothing wrong with needing milk when you're a baby, but if you're like 15 or 20 or 40 years old and, and you can't eat solid food, you still need milk, you know, he's, he's, he's exhorting them. Come on, there's more. And the beginning of chapter 6 says, here's the elementary principles, which we went over last week. There's more to it. 
And you know what the more is? It's not deeper theological mysteries that you need a PhD to figure out. Yes. Nothing wrong with PhDs. But you know what? I love their research. I get a lot out of it, you know? But the point is, that's not what it's about. What it is about is, get by the initial steps of becoming a Christian and enter into relationship with your father as a child of God. And live your life, begin to learn how to live your life as a son of God. You can get up in the morning and shake off the sleepies and wake up and throw your shoulders back and take a deep breath and stick your chest out and say, I am a child of the king of the universe. Nothing can go wrong. Whatever happens, that doesn't change. I am holy and blameless. I am accepted to, with my father. I have a place of, of standing with him that cannot be shaken. No matter what happens, and you will begin to live a different life than you've lived before. This is the goal. This is moving on to solid food. This is, you know, today, if you hear God's voice, building that relationship, speaking with God, hearing his voice, letting him lead and guide you, letting him tell you how to position yourself. When someone comes against you and you're offended and you say, God, are you still the king? This is my favorite one. I do this thousands of times if something happens. Not that somebody offends me thousands of times, but, you know, thousands of times, little things can go wrong, right? And so he, we just got this little conversation going. Is God, are you still the king? Oh, yeah. Well, am I still your son? Yes. So I'm the son of the king of the universe. Well, who cares about this little thing? And I can just, it's not like I don't care about people, but I am not going to let what comes my way influence and change my position that I have, that Jesus fought for, that Jesus died for, that Jesus went through agony for, and I love it if he gets his money's worth. You know what? Because he paid a huge price so that I could live like a son of God on this earth, just like he did. The king of the universe wants to build an intimate relationship with you. There's so much more. He wants to take your hand and show you the place he has for you in your business. Your identity is, is to... Your destiny is to enjoy being God's child in your life, despite anything. I thought if I was God's child, everything would just go steadily uphill without a single speed bump. No, it's in spite of anything that can happen. My hope is sure. My anchor is firm. Let's stand and pray. Father, I pray that the immensity of what's being offered would penetrate our thinking and change our small-minded, self-focused lives into the wonder of the opportunity to experience personal, intimate relationship with you, Father, the King of the universe. Penetrate our thinking. Change our hearts, O oh God. We said, come and consume, God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We sang it, God, come and consume self-focus, self-centeredness, self-provision, self, you know, dreaming of our, you know, of our own destiny, trying to make our own way. And help us to see that what you want to give us is so much greater because it's exactly what we're made for, what we're put together for, what we're on this earth for. Father, Break through, break through, break through. Show us who we are. Thank you for being a faithful high priest. Thank you for being our eternal high priest. We don't have to worry about your term ending or you're dying off or something and who's going to replace you. You are the eternal, forever, faithful high priest. We love you. Thank you for what you've done in, making, in bringing us to Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, bless this word to us, and uh, Holy Spirit, come and convict us, and change us, and delight us, and thrill us with whatever portion or piece of this that applies to each person who's here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.